All right, uh, brothers and sisters, when Adam and Eve, the very first human couple, made in the image of God, both of them, male and female, when they rebelled against God, sin entered the world. Sin is everything nasty, everything mean-spirited, everything dark, everything in our hearts that we do and say that are hurtful to other people, hurtful to ourselves. Sin destroys friendships, marriages, churches. There would never be a broken relationship if there were no sin. We have sin to thank for all of this. It has wrought a terrible thing in our world. All the misery, all the tears, all the, the cold hearts, all the lonely hearts, all the bitterness, a result of humanity turning away from the living God. God, in his goodness, in his greatness, created uh, a beautiful world, and he created a garden, paradise, the garden of delight, and he put Adam and Eve in there, and he intended for them to love each other and to love him. It's hard to love each other. It's hard to love our enemies. You know, God calls us to more. God, Jesus didn't say, I want you to, to uh, love the people that treat you well. That's easy. You don't need the Holy Spirit to love people that treat you well. You can be an angry person. You can be a wonderful person that's turned away from God. You can be, you know, a, a Buddhist or a, a Hindu or a Muslim. You can be anything and Say, I like that person because they're nice to me. It takes a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit to say, I am going to choose <coughs> to love my husband, even though he irritates me. I am going to choose to appreciate my parents, even though they don't understand me. I am going to uh, choose to love my neighbor who's trying to take advantage of me. I am going to choose to love my coworker and they gossip about me, and I'm trying here, I'm trying, and they don't get it, and they're talking about me behind my back. I'm going to choose to love them. And what that means is not only working on my heart, but the things I do, my desire is to bless them. But my, the things I do, my desire is to, is to bring them closer to Christ. I was, Rachel had a couple songs. By the way, that first song that we had was written by Dad. Isn't that fun? First song we sang today. Uh, but one of the songs she was talking about making straight the paths, and John the Baptist, his role was to make straight the paths for Jesus Christ. What that means is my life, your life, it's hard to find Christ. And when people think of Christianity in America, you know what they think of? They think of politics. They, 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 they think about uh, the, a bunch of self-righteous people, or they think about that aunt that they couldn't stand, or that uncle, or whatever. People have all these, or maybe they were abused as a child, or, or heaven forbid, maybe they were abused in the church. And so there's all this barrier, and our jobs as Christians are supposed to make, take, knock all the barriers down. We're making flat the road to the Lord. We want to live our lives so that Jesus is attractive. How are you responding to the, to the jerks? <laughs> How are you responding to the irritating people? How are you responding to the people that they don't like you? They don't want to treat you well. How do you respond? And that determines whether you are putting up more walls or whether you're knocking down walls so that people can see the true Jesus as he really is. Brothers and sisters, we want to make a highway to the Lord. We want to live lives and we want our families to, to live in such a way and we want our church to be such a church that people know that love is real, that God is real, that these truths, the eternal truths, are real, and, and that so that they can turn and they can know the Lord and they can be saved and they can be filled up with the Holy Spirit and that they can go to heaven. And at our Bibles, at our baptisms, I was pointing around at the different people who, who up for the first 40 years of their life, wouldn't have had anything to do with Christ, who were angry at Christ, who maybe had, had been decades living as an atheist or a pagan or, or just hostile to Christianity, and this person was saved, this person was saved, this person was saved. All these different people did not see Christ, and then they saw Christ, and it made a difference in their lives. We want to be people that are not 
furthering the curse. Adam and Eve brought the curse, the fall, when sin entered our world. We want to be people who are joining the Lord to battle against the curse. And there has been darkness in our lives and in our world ever since the fall. You know it and I know it. And if you turn on the evening news, in fact, a lot of people don't even want to watch the news because there is so much darkness. And a lot of people are afraid of human relationships because there's so much darkness. And a lot of people are afraid of looking deep inside because of what they'll see. One of the first things that happened when sin entered the world is there was division between Adam and Eve. God brought them together intimately, wanted them to love each other. He wanted them to, to populate the earth together and be in relationship with him. And when, when Eve was tempted by the serpent, and she brought the, the fruit to Adam and, and he foolishly ate of it. And God came down in the cool of the evening and said, hey, what's going on here? Remember what Adam did? He blamed God. And he blamed his wife for his choice. Well, I wouldn't be like this if she hadn't said that. Or I wouldn't be like this if she hadn't acted like that. I wouldn't be like this. That is the curse. Amen. That is the fall. Amen. It's brought division between husbands and wives. Jesus Christ is coming back to get his bride. We saw that in the, in the songs that we sang. Uh, the, the relationship between a husband and wife is so special and so unique, ordained right at the beginning in Genesis. And this relationship is supposed to be a mirror. It's supposed to reflect God's relationship with his church. God, God, but there's a difference. Remember in uh, most ancient cultures, in Jewish ancient culture, the, uh, the family of the bride had to basically pay money, say, please take this daughter off of our hands, you know. Yeah, I can understand. No, I can't understand. No, what am I saying? No. Uh, so, guys, we have this situation where, where you would have to give a dowry and say, here, take our... Jesus paid the price with his own blood. We have a groom who we didn't pay him to be with him. He paid everything. He paid it all. He, he paid himself. He bled and died so that we could be in a relationship with him. That means he really loves you. That means he really wants to be with you. Uh, this is the relationship that was broken by the fall. This is the terrible situation we're in. And uh, Adam blamed God. He blamed Eve. Eve blamed the serpent. Nobody took responsibility for their own actions. And there is all sorts of anger and impatience and brutal brutality and, and hatred where you just get like this when you think of some folks and unforgiveness. Bitterness. Bitterness that makes your days sick. Bitterness that makes you physically sick. Bitterness that you think about it and all it does, you feel your blood bo uh, boil up you think about this group of people and what they did, and you think about the history. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, in a marriage, if you're really, really, if you've got a good memory, and you're really good at remembering everything your spouse did wrong, I want to congratulate you. You are a world-class fool, and you're going to have a terrible, <laughs> terrible wedding. You're going to have a terrible, terrible marriage. You cannot remember, and, and if every people group remembers everything that was ever done wrong to them, you're going to be miserable. Every country... Every country has its share of wickedness. And I'm not, by the way, if you are the one that was doing the wickedness to your spouse, or if you were a part of the people group that was doing the wickedness, repent. Don't, don't say, get over it. That's, that's not your job. The Holy Spirit will work on them, and the Holy Spirit should work on you to be a good repenter. I wish that, uh, brothers and sisters, I wish that everybody could know Jesus, uh, could know forgiveness could no hope. Imagine, imagine when you turn on that news and there's so much misery and so much anger and, and, and shaking fists. What if that person was filled up with the Holy Spirit? Amen. What if that person was filled up with the love of God? What if instead of a bunch of guys with communist flags on one side and a bunch of guys with Nazi flags on the other side, 
threw those down, ran forward, embraced each other, and fell down weeping because of the goodness of Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you think the world would be a better place today? Amen. Do you think the world would be a better place if we are just getting rid of all, all of this darkness and wickedness and anger and bitterness inside of us and falling at the foot of the cross saying, I'm a sinner and I need grace. And, and I know you're a sinner too. And so I'm not going to hold this impossible standard to you because God's forgiven me of so much. I want to be a good forgiver. And we, and we forgive our brothers and we forgive our sisters and we forgive those who don't even know Christ yet. Uh, because God has forgiven us of so much. Let's look at uh, John chapter 14. I wish everybody could know Jesus, and I, and I pray that all the time that our church will be a church of people that shows the love of Jesus everywhere we go. John 14, 1. Listen to Jesus' words. And if, you are, uh, if you're troubled by the world around you, listen to what Jesus has to say. Again, things are going fast now. We're right at the end. We're right at the end of, uh, of uh, Jesus' earthly ministry. He's going quickly. He's quickly going to the cross. John chapter 14, verse 1. 2,000 years ago, Jesus said these words here on earth. Let's read the words of Jesus Christ. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Isn't that nice? We've got a Savior that uh, he knows. Why would he say, don't let your hearts be troubled? Why would he say that? You got an idea? Anybody? He said, don't let your hearts be troubled because our hearts are troubled. He said, don't let your hearts be troubled because we have all of this uh, worry and fear and concern in our lives. We are a distressed people. Uh, We're distressed about our health in the things the doctor said to us that we don't like. We're distressed about uh, our financial situation. You check, in your, you check in your bank account, that can be distressing at times. Uh, we're distressed about friendships that aren't working. We're distressed about drama in our lives. We're distressed about people who don't understand us. We're distressed about the way we treated other people. We're distressed about the things, how did that come out of my mouth? We're distressed about the thoughts that go on in our heart. God is so good and so beautiful, and what is going on with me? And we're distressed, and we're troubled. We're troubled deep inside, and, and all we see all around us is distress and trouble. Last week, I said that feeling this unease, this distress, this trouble in your soul is not a sin. You remember that? But here, Christ is telling us, do not let your hearts be troubled. So, what is he telling us? Well, <clears throat> let's, for a little background, in uh, John eleven thirty two, when Mary came to Jesus and saw him, this is at the, at the tomb of Lazarus, remember? She came and she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So that's showing faith, but it's also showing accusation. Oftentimes, the way we, we relate to God. God, I believe in you, but why? God, I believe in you, but why is my situation this? Why do I have to go through this? Lord, if you had acted, if you had been here, if you would have done things differently, this would not have happened. My brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews had come, had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. And it's the exact same word that's used here in John 14.1. So Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled, but Jesus was troubled in the exact same way. Amen. John 12, 27, now my soul is troubled. This is Jesus talking. Yes. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it is for this purpose that I have come to this hour. You notice what happened in those first two examples? Jesus is troubled, and then he goes on to do the right thing. He's troubled, but he goes on to glorify God. And then last week we saw in John 13, 21, when Jesus was telling his disciples that one of them would betray him, he used the same word to describe his own heart being troubled because betrayal hurts. In each instance, Jesus is troubled, but in each instance, Jesus is not a slave to it. Uh, he's, he doesn't give in to it. He doesn't surrender to it. He doesn't wallow in it. He still chooses and does what is right. So the world is troubling. 
Yet, we're told by Christ not to let our hearts give in to being troubled. Uh, why should we not be troubled? Why should we not be troubled? Because it's not manly, because it's not cool, because it's not what a mature person does. That's not any of the answers he gave. Because everything is, because everything is actually rainbows, and if you put on rose-colored glasses, you would see that everything's nice, rainbows and roses. No, Jesus does not say this. There's a reason Jesus doesn't say this, because that would be wrong, and Jesus is never wrong. He said, in this life you have trouble. No, Jesus gives an answer why we should not let our hearts be troubled, but, and he thought it was appropriate. That's why he said it. But many people today don't like it. Let's look again, uh, John chapter 14, 1 through 3. <clears throat> Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, also believe in me. And here's why. My father's house has many rooms. Maybe your translation says uh, that my father has many mansions, and so you think of like the Bruce Wayne Manor or some mansion out in the countryside all by itself. You've got beautiful trees all around it. It's lonely. It's isolated. And Jesus said, my father's house has many rooms. This is a different idea. This is all of us being together. If that were not so, I would have told you, if that were not so, I, if that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? Jesus is going to prepare a place for his bride. He's going to prepare a place for the ones he loves. He's going to build a wonderful place for us to all be together. And, and this is a Bible verse I memorized as a little boy, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back. I'm going and I'm going to make a place for you. I'm going to make a, a nest. You know, you, you, young men, you want to get married? Make a nest for your sweetie. Uh, Jesus said, I'm going, and I'm going to make a place, and I'm going to get my bride, and I'm going to take my bride back home to be with me forever. I will come back, and I will take you to be with me. And in this idea in love, we, you ever look around at this world and feel like, this is not right, and we have an unease. Like, this is, I was made for something better than this. Guess what? You were. You were made to be a child of the king. And, and we have this idea where the princess is in trouble or something, or, or, or you have the, 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 this, the uh, <clears throat> yeah, thank you. We have the, uh, that's exactly what I'm trying to say, the, the uh, Cinderella. The idea that, the, that she's a princess, but she's in a tough situation, and, and life is difficult. She's covered in soot. And a prince comes along and says, hey, baby. No. He, he says, a prince, a prince comes along and says, take me by the hand. I will take you away from here. I've got something better for, for you. I will take you away. And we literally have a prince in heaven who has gone through hell itself in order to win us. And he reaches down and says, you are made for something better. All the way back to the garden. You are made for paradise Follow me, I'll take you away. You are made for something better. We feel it in our hearts, and it's true. We were not made for this misery, this toil, this, this hardship, this, this death and tears all around us. We have a, a, a good God. Now, I said some people won't like this. Remember that? You know why? Because a lot of people say, well, Jesus is saying, put up with your life because uh, someday he's going to come back. You're going to be so uh, heavenly minded, you're not going to be any earthly good. All, all you want to do is, is focus on eternity, and right now you're not helping the world or helping any situation whatsoever. All you're doing is waiting for the future. Uh, okay, again, you say that because you're not interpreting Scripture well. Uh, it never says that. In fact, if you read this in context, uh, if you read this, uh, he's talking to his followers about unity here on earth about fellowship here on earth, about loving one another here on earth. He continually, his earthly ministry was about going out, helping the poor, loving people, bringing people into one family. If you think suddenly out of, you'd grab these verses out of the blue and say, well, that means Jesus doesn't want us to care about this world or care about other people, you are wrong. And, and there's no way I can say that differently. You're not interpreting scripture properly. All throughout the New Testament, it focuses on who we should be here and now, how we should act, and knowing the future informs us of how we should behave now. Amen? Amen? Amen. Knowing the future helps us to understand how we should behave, how we should love, how we should treat people around us now. 
I really think that God has been working me over on, on these passages just in the last couple of years. I think I, I've grown in this, and I can already see a change in my heart. And, it, and it's a good change. And, you know, I, I've been uh, preaching since I was about 16. And, and it's, uh, it's okay to still be learning new things, isn't it? It's, it's, a new, it's a good thing to have God still working on me. Brothers, sisters, I had gotten to a place. I, I've always loved people. I'm not a good pastor in this way, in this way, in this way, and I'm not going like, to tell you how I'm not a good pastor. You guys already know, and I don't want you to be thinking, of, thinking about that right now. Yeah, he's right, actually, you know. Uh, but one thing that God's given me is a heart for people. I love people. I love, I love people that aren't Christians, and I love Christians, and I want everybody to come and know Jesus. And, but one thing that I had been thinking, and I had allowed myself to think, not in a bitter way, but when I thought about heaven, for years I was thinking, Maybe God gives each one of us a lonely planet. <laughs> and we have this beautiful house, and maybe made out of stone, and maybe some waterfalls. And year after year, you don't see anybody. And there's just the nature and the wind and the breeze. And sometimes your best friends, those you went through the wars with on earth, the people you worshiped with, your wife, your children, sometimes you visit them, sometimes they visit you. Always the Holy Spirit is in Jesus Christ are around us at all times. And I thought, what a, what a peaceful, quiet way. Uh, and then I was taught <laughs> that I'm off my rocker and I'm wrong. <laughs> that is an incorrect view of paradise. Paradise put Adam and Eve together and told them, make more. <laughs> Now, in heaven, we're not making more. Jesus Christ said there's no more children up there. But in heaven, he brings all his children together. Uh, and, and the idea of God, God's idea of paradise was different than Dan's idea of paradise because God already existed in eternity. And he, well, but he didn't exist in loneliness because of the Trinity. But he decided to create more people, and he created us in order to be with him. God is like that old grandpa that, wants, that just loves to sit in a room with all his family around. He wants to bring us all to be around. And so what he's saying uh, was when he builds a, a mansion, when he builds a house, it's more like apartments. And, and in that culture, you, you, you'd have the father, and when his, when his son would get married, they'd build on another extension, sometimes another level or another level or next door. And then they, the wife would move in. And there'd be, like you've seen Roman courtyards before, the Jews would do that too, Japanese too. But they kept building on additions so that the whole family could be together. And Jesus is saying, we're going to all be together. That's difficult, isn't it? Because I, I, when we think about, uh, when we think about uh, humanity, we often think, well, the toughest part of my job is what? Other people, right? Uh, I, I heard uh, one pastor say, uh, who will remain unnamed, uh, but doesn't come to this church. Uh, God is great. People suck. <laughs> and, and, and every pastor knows what he's talking about. And, and uh, it, that's true. It's, it's easy to, brothers and sisters, it's easy to think that you're a wonderful person when you're out in the cabin all by yourself. Boy, I don't argue with anybody. I'm so easy to get along with. I, I'm, I'm a Mr. Wonderful, as my dad calls himself. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, did that slip out, Dad? <clears throat> uh, the, the rest of us call him Mr. Wonderful, too. Uh, in, in, in uh, all of this idea of being alone is contrary to the heart of God. Uh, we're made, by the way, to need one another. In, in the theology class this week, we saw that everyone in the church is needed and we often think everyone in church is needed. Yep, check. And I need other people. Wait, I don't know. I'm pretty self-sufficient. I don't know if I need other people. The Bible teaches us we need one another. <clears throat> they need us and that that's a good thing. Maybe you're thinking, I don't need anybody. I'm pretty tough. I don't need the church. I'm pretty self-sufficient. Maybe you think that you're like a cowboy and needing other people is weakness. I'll tell you what. 
Maybe somebody irritates you. Well, you need to practice patience. Maybe, maybe somebody is, is always getting on your nerves. Well, you need to learn to pray about that. We need one another. And when people tell me I couldn't be in the church because there's a bunch of sinners, uh, well, I'll tell you what, uh, then you need to be there so you can learn to put up with other people that are just as messed up as you are. Uh, that thought that we don't need anybody is a sinful thought. We do need one another, and that's the way God made us. And it's not sin or weakness to know that we need our sisters and brothers. Think back to Adam. Think back to Adam before sin, before the fall, before sin entered the world. Adam was alone, and this is perfect world. He's alone, and God said, it's not good. Did you ever think about that? It's not good. That's before sin entered the world. Because God created uh, us to be in relationship. He's a God of relationship. And Adam was alone. And God says, that's not good. That means this idea of, uh, I feel alone and I need brothers and sisters. I need to be part of something bigger. I need a family. That is not due to sin or weakness. That's the way you were made. We were made to be part of something bigger than ourselves. We were made to be part of God's family. This is a tremendously important idea. God has ordained relationship. God has ordained community. God wants his children in the church to enjoy community. God wants us to enjoy togetherness. God wants us to enjoy relationship. In the church, this is the way it's supposed to be. If you think about... uh, God, and I, and I touched briefly on this, the idea of the Trinity. If, if Sometimes people think, well, that's theology. I don't want to talk about the Trinity. I don't need to understand that. And they think that the Trinity is some extra add-on to Christianity. Brothers and sisters, it's not incidental. It's essential to Christianity. Because of the Trinity, we have a God who's not needy. He was self-sufficient because he already had Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in this perfect love relationship. God did not create humanity because he needed somebody to love and he needed somebody to love him back. He already had the perfect love relationship. He created humanity to bring us in out of the overflow of his love. He wanted to bring us into this loving relationship. From the beginning, it's all about relationship. Genesis, all about relationship. I want you to think about this huge, giant universe. All of it was made so that we could be in relationship with God. The, the, the meaning of the universe is love. The reason it's all here is so that we could love. This is what God is all about. Romans 12, think about this, what God commands. Romans 12, 4 through 5. Just as there are many parts to our bodies, so it is with Christ's body. We are all parts of it, and it takes every one of us to be complete. For for each of us have different works to do, so we belong to each other, and each needs all the others. Well, I suppose if the Bible says I need other people, I suppose. Uh, Ephesians 4, 15 through 16, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. As each part does its own special work, as each person does their own special work, it helps the other parts to grow. You're not here just to be blessed. You're here also to be a blessing so that the whole body of Christ will grow, and it says, and be full of love. There's a lot of one another verses in the Bible. You can't do forgive one another, love one another, uh, all these things uh, when we're alone. Uh, 1 Peter 4.10, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another, this time out in the church, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And it's about togetherness, and there's room at the foot of the cross for you and me. There's room at the foot of the cross for more people. There's room at the foot of the cross for people who have different educations than we do. There's room at the foot of the cross who are at different income brackets than we are. There's room at the foot of the cross for people who speak different languages, who eat weird food, who have different skin skin tones than we do. There is room at the foot of the cross for every single person. And if the world knew that, we wouldn't have all this conflict, and it would be beautiful. It would be wonderful. 
Genesis 1:26 and 27, I already touched on this. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Uh, Men are made in the image of God. Women are different than men, and they're made in the image of God. And together we have the full picture of who God is. James 2, 1 through 4, My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favoritism in the church. Can't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting a place wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, uh, we've got a recliner, uh, and, and you say to the, to the other fella, why don't you go sit on the floor that doesn't have carpet, uh, sit on the floor by my feet. You, have you not sh- uh, discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Well, God doesn't want that kind of discrimination. He wants us to be discriminating to understand right and wrong, but he does not want to discriminate against people based upon appearance. Is that clear? Is that clear? We can't have that in the church. James 2, uh, 8 through 9. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Uh, How do we show favoritism? Well, these people like the kind of music I like. Well, these people dress the way I dress. Well, these people uh, are reasonable, and they like the Green Bay Packers, unlike some other people. Uh, we, d- we discriminate based upon the way people smell, the way they look, the, the way they talk. Uh, and we think we look down at people because they don't talk or think or look the way we want them to. And God says, if you do that, you're convicted by the law as a lawbreaker. 1 John 2.11, but anyone who hates a brother or sister is in darkness and walks around in darkness. They do not know where they're going because the darkness has blinded them. Lord, we don't want that to be true of our church, do we? Uh, So we can't be, hate blinds you. You're not seeing when you're hating. John 7.24, stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. Judge on character. Acts 10.34-36, Then Peter started speaking. I truly now understand. I get it, finally. See, here's a spiritual man who's learning something. I now truly understand that God does not show favoritism in dealing with people, but in every nation, the the person who fears him and does what is right is welcomed by him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, proclaiming the good news of peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all, not Lord of just uh, people from the Middle East where he came from. Thank goodness he's Lord of white people and, and, and black people and, and American Indians and, and Asians of all, all sorts. Thank goodness he is Lord of all. Leviticus 19, 34, 33 and 34. When a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. Don't pay them less because you know they're in trouble with the government and they, you can get away with paying them less. Uh, do not do that. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. He's talking to the people of Israel. I am the Lord your God. So how about that? You better treat foreigners right. I am the Lord your God. (laughs) He puts his stamp down. He puts his foot down. Why? Because it's difficult to treat people who are different nicely. Because they're different because they're weird. (laughs) They do things because they didn't grow up like my family. By the way... Americans, we got our acts together. And I don't know about people on the East Coast and West Coast. And I'm really not sure about people in the South, but the Midwest, I mean, we're the fruit of... But, but Illinois, that's different. And uh, Chet and Rachel, you guys are from Michigan now. That is, you know... Uh, and let's face it, Minnesota is not like Wisconsin. We know that. Wisconsin, that's where the people are at. Well, not Milwaukee, not Madison, Right? It's more like, yeah, southern Wisconsin and some places up north. That's uh, but it's really, I mean, Janesville, way better than Milton, Beloit, Edgerton. Uh, sorry, sorry, everybody. <laughs> but even in Janesville, it's really kind of an east side, west side kind of thing, isn't it? You're Craig or Parker. And uh, 
but when I think about it, it, you know, I grew up at Washington, Washington school I went to. It was like way, I mean, the people there are much more reasonable than the people who went to like grade schools. <laughs> and, but really, even there, it's kind of just like me and my friends. We were the ones who had our acts together. Well, they didn't quite understand the way my family did. I mean, our family, we had it together, but not, not mom and dad sometimes, you know. And, <laughs> And, and Paul, I'll tell you what, I don't know about you and, and, and Rachel, and I really had my act together. Wait, no, I didn't. Do you see what sin does? It keeps dividing, 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 so we get smaller and smaller and smaller. And Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. He's calling all people everywhere to come to him in faith. There is room at the foot of the cross for all sorts of people. Uh, there's room at the foot of the cross for you and for me and for everyone else. And God says, you better treat people who are different, right? I'm the Lord, your God, and you don't want to mess with me. Romans 1.16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. Amen? Amen? We're not ashamed that Jesus Christ died for us and that all people can be part of this family. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Well, there's Jewish people, then there's everybody else. If you're not Jewish, you're part of everybody else. Thank goodness he loved everybody else too. Romans 10, 12 through 13, For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who come uh, to him. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Colossians 3, 11 through 12, Here there is no Gentile, no Jew, no circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian. This is interesting. He names the Jews and Gentiles generically, uh, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarians. The, Jew, the Greek people called people barbarians because they couldn't understand their language. It sounded like they're always saying, bar, 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 bar. That's literally true. They thought other languages sounded stupid. And so they called them bar, bar. They're a bunch of bar, bars. The, but they named Scythians. Scythians were a bunch of nomadic horse people. And he brings them out specifically because they were scary. They were dangerous. Uh, they were known as being violent, so violent that they'd ride into a town, kill everybody, and they'd cut open the bellies of pregnant women, women and rip out the babies. And God is saying, God chose the Scythians as an example. When they come to faith, they're part of the family too. Gentile, Jew, those crazy guys riding around in horses that you can't stand. He goes on slave or free, and in that culture, slaves belonged to their masters. They were owned, slave and free. But Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, therefore, because these things don't exist in the church, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. By the way, are you Christian? You're holy. Are you Christian? You are dearly loved. Therefore, clothe yourselves with compassion. Wait. I thought if we were Christians, we didn't have to worry about this life. We're just heavenly minded. We think about the next life. No. Because you are a Christian, because you're holy and loved by God, be compassionate to other people. Amen. Christian, are we known by our compassion? Clothe yourselves with compassion. Put it on. Clothe yourself with kindness. How about clothe yourself with humility? Well, what if I'm Greek and I am part of the, this great culture and, and I speak this great language? And what if I'm a wealthy Greek? And what if I'm, I'm known for being a poet or a philosopher or a warrior? Why do I have to be humble? Well, because you're saved by grace just like everybody else. Listen to this. This is what a Christian should be about. Are you compassionate, kind, humble? He says, put on, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Well, it's easy to be patient with people who behave the way you like. Difficult to be patient with people who are acting the way you don't like. Jesus said uh, his father's home has many rooms, because Jesus wants us all to be there Amen. together for eternity. You don't like your husband? Better learn to like him. You're stuck with him for eternity if he's a believer. Uh, can't stand. <laughs> I saw some looks between husbands and wives. <laughs> can't stand, uh, can't stand uh, some person in the church. Oh, I can't worship with this person week after week. Oh, my goodness. Am I going to be stuck with him for eternity? Yes. You will be uh, in the church, in, in the body of Christ. 
better learn to get along with each other now because Jesus didn't not planning to put us on some lonely planet uh, where the wind blows and there's horizons as far as you can see there ain't a soul anywhere it sounds nice big library by the way uh, he didn't intend us for that he says we're gonna scrunch in all together and I'm gonna pack you in here and I'm putting another person here and another family here and we're gonna because he wants all his family to be to get together and he loves to look around and see all of his children uh, Jesus said his father's home has many rooms and he died so that more people could be there Let's live our lives so that more people are there. Adding on rooms as a son would bring his bride home. Jesus wants to bring his people together and bring them on home. God longs to bring us home, which is a scary thought when we're praying for, Lord, please preserve my life. Please keep my wife alive. Please keep my kids alive. Psalm 115 tells us that the death of his saints is precious to him because he's bringing them home. He loves to bring his people home. But because of sin, we are separated from holy God, and relationships are hard. Uh, relationships are really hard. If you're going to love somebody, you're going to be hurt. If you're going to make yourself vulnerable, you're going to be disappointed. People, we let each other down. We're all guilty of it. That's why we need grace, and love covers a multitude of sin. Love hurts. Relationships are hard, and yet they're worth it, and it's what God has called us to. The point of this entire thing, the church, is love and unity. The point of this entire creation is love and unity. God created us to be together with him, to be together with one another, and there is everything good and nothing wrong about learning to be humble. Amen. Let me repeat. There is everything good and nothing wrong about learning to be humble. Say, I was on the wrong track. Oops, going to be on the right track. There is everything good and nothing wrong when we confess our sins. There is, and there is everything good and nothing wrong when we speak with one another with gentleness and patience. Everything good, nothing wrong when we overlook wrongs done to us. Everything good, nothing wrong when we learn to have peace with one another and in our church and in our homes because Jesus is coming back to bring his children home to be with him and this informs us of how we live now. How we treat people now how we raise our kids now, the choices we make now, the way we talk now, our priority is now because it's all about togetherness and our destiny is togetherness. First John 4, 7, Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Okay, last thought. Chairs and carpet. Let's get practical about love. Uh, no pews. Practically, 2 Timothy 2, 3, and 4, join me in suffering. We're going to put that one right up there. <laughs> join us in suffering, you know. Jo Paul says, join me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. A soldier refrains from entangling himself in civilian affairs. It means earthly things, physical things. In order to please the one who enlisted him, join together in suffering. We make sacrifices as a people for the kingdom of God. Brothers and sisters, there are Christians who are literally dying for their faith all over the world. More Christians are dying right now for their faith than in the time of the Roman Empire. Amen. People are, are suffering. It's possible that you could miss a job promotion. It's so possible that your uh, friends or family might not understand you or where you're coming from because of your faith. Paul says, join us in suffering. Sitting on a really nice chair like Dennis is sitting on is not called joining in suffering. That is not uh, having to sing... Uh, where there's no carpet, but the acoustics are wonderful. It was so great to hear the voices fill up. That is not suffering. These are good times, and we're going to make wonderful memories together. If, if a tornado came through and we had to set up a bunch of chairs or, or claws outside and sit around on the ground, that's a little bit of suffering. <laughs> I, I, I mean, by, I, you know, Amen. to be together, to have voices to sing to the Lord, to be able to open our scriptures and read together, regardless of what we're sitting on, regardless of where we're sitting. This is not called suffering. So, dear friends, let us love one another. Let us join together. Let, let, sometimes it's difficult to live out the Christian life. Sometimes it's messy because relationships are messy. Sometimes it's hard because people are, God is great, people suck, you know. Uh, but let's get practical and let's make this love practical and let's not give up on the Lord. Let's not give up on one another. Grab a hold of each other's hands and go forward for what the Lord has for us. So glad everyone was here today. Let's pray.
Dear God, thank you for being so good to us. Thank you for your love. Thank you for bringing us into this unity, this community, this union. Lord, we want to follow you with everything we've got. We pray this in your name. Amen.